Well, we are in a new sermon series called Out of the Grave. Well, not new. We are in week three. And week one, we talked about when we receive Jesus into our hearts, into our lives as Lord and Savior, we just don't accept the personhood of God, but we receive all of His traditions all of his ways we walk in god we don't just come out of distance but we walk in his statutes and in his ways in week two pastor jackie my wife amazing come on somebody she preached on that jesus is the treasure he's the one that we get full wisdom and knowledge from and the way that we do it is through the word that we need to get in our word so i hope you guys forgot in your word this week if you didn't there's grace but we're gonna be better amen Amen, amen. All right, and this week, I wanted to continue in our sermon series, Colossians 2, verses 6 through 10, and I wanted to focus on 8 through 10, but we're going to read the whole thing. You guys ready? All right, let's stand for the reading of God's Word, because we honor the Word of God. We believe it is living and active. It can change our lives in this moment. You guys ready? Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. It says this, Therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him who is head of all rule and authority. Could I get an amen? And today I just wanted to ask a simple question. Have you been taken captive by the philosophy of this world? And we're going to be diving into that and answering that question with a message I'm entitling, Hold Fast. Look at your neighbor and say, Hold Fast. Now look at your other neighbor and say, Hold Fast. If your voice squeaks like mine, even better. You guys ready to pray? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is living and active. And God, we're not reading your word. You're reading, you're, you're reading us. You're revealing things in our hearts that we need to know. So God, we pray that today, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would reveal things in our lives that we need to know. And God, we thank you that you're moving right now, that you're among our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Go ahead and take your seats. Amazing, amazing. Now, if you haven't read the book of Colossians, uh, Colossians starts off by saying in chapter 2, verses 3 to 4, in whom, when they say in whom, this is Jesus that they're talking about, all things are hidden, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Last week, we established again that Christ is the center, that Christ is the hidden, and all things are hidden within him. All the treasures of knowledge and wisdom, everything that we need is found within his word. And what Paul is doing is making clear to the Colossians to hold fast to Jesus so that no one may delude you of what is plausible or plausible arguments. But the reality is this, that there are opposing thoughts there are opposing traditions to Christ worldly traditions or principles that sound right that mask itself in wisdom it sounds plausible but it opposes Jesus you know when your friend says something smart and then you find out a week later you're just like that was kind of dumb like why did I do that 75 hard why did I do that that was just really dumb why would I do that I'm just kidding just some people are doing it but I don't think it's them I I look up to them that's amazing and what I'm hoping today is this and it's really simple I'm hoping by the help of the Holy Spirit, we would have revelation to be aware of philosophies or to be aware of the wisdom of the world according to the elemental spirits. There's some crazy words in here, but do not worry. We are about to get into it. You guys ready? I need to ask you guys a question. Have you ever done something because you were convinced it was right? Yeah? And then you grew up a little bit and then you look back and you're like, I was kind of dumb. I was quite foolish. Um, I, I'm like that too. I'm not exempt. Just because I'm your pastor doesn't mean I don't do dumb things. Like when I was a little kid, example, small example, we've all done it before. You know, tooth comes out of your mouth and then what do you do with the tooth? You put it under your pillow, right? And what happens? A flying demon comes into your room, right? Flying demon comes into your room, gets your tooth and gives you some money, right? Amen. I look forward to seeing that demon every night when I was a little kid. Who said that? <laughs> My goodness. 
but I put it under my bed because I believed that a fairy would come. <laughs> I don't know. A fairy would come and just give me some money. It was a philosophy based on a fairy that exchanged teeth for money. That's, that, that, that's kind of weird, right? The wisdom was based on a fairy that exchanges teeth for money. Just imagine that. Someone that just collects teeth. That's strange. Anyways. It's strange. There's some strange philosophies out there. But are you curious to know what your generation believes in? You guys want to hear it? All right, I'm going to just dive straight into it. 65 of Gen Z believe that lying is morally okay. 65%. That's pretty close. 50-50 split. 70% believe that abortion is moral. Hey, yo, yo, yo. 62% believe that marriage does not need to be lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. 80% believe that sex before marriage is moral. 80% believe that homosexual behavior is moral. It's a philosophy based on the idea that the right belief are the ones that don't hurt anyone. And so if you look at a common thread, I'm not calling out your generation. Millennials, we got stuff we need to work on too. Like, don't you worry. But I'm here to pastor you, so I'm talking about you. Is that okay? And the, the philosophy of he is based on like, if I don't hurt anybody, then it's the right belief. If it doesn't hurt me, if it doesn't hurt you, what's the problem with believing it or endorsing it or getting behind it? And maybe we find ourselves in that camp today where we've let philosophies or wisdoms of the world creep into our heart and it has diluted the call of God in our lives. It has diluted what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But I don't blame you. The thing about worldly philosophies or wisdom is that it's deceptive. And it's actually quite attractive. It sounds right. It sounds right most of the time and through virtual signaling. But at the end of the day, it's empty. For those of you guys that don't know what virtual signaling is, it's playing to your emotions to what you feel like should be right when it's actually not. So what Paul means when he says not to be taken captive of this philosophy. What is he talking about? What is he saying when he says to the Colossians, do not be taken captive by these philosophies? In verse 8, it says this, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human traditions, according to elemental spirits, we're about to get into that, of the world and not according to Christ. Now, there's nothing wrong with philosophy. When we break down the word, phileo means lover, and sophia means wisdom. So if we look at the word in and of itself, it simply means a lover of wisdom. Now, whether it's a good or bad thing, thing is just dependent on what that wisdom is based on. Does that make sense? So is the wisdom based on the world, or is the wisdom based on God? which is why there was such a heavy emphasis last week to be rooted in Christ, to be rooted in the truth, to have your roots sink down deep into the things of God so that we're not shaken by the philosophies or the wisdoms of the world. Because no one here, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like being deceived. Who in here likes being deceived? Not a single one of y'all. No one likes being deceived. I don't like being manipulated. I don't like being lied to. It's a sucky feeling where you're just like, oh, I just found out the truth. Oh, you deceived me. Tooth fairy, little demon, right? It's wild. No one likes it. No one likes that feeling. And Paul is reminding the believers, let no one take you captive. This phrase, let no one take you captive, it actually means kidnap. Do not let anyone kidnap your thoughts. Don't let anyone arrest your thoughts. Don't just surrender it to people. So don't let these false teachers kidnap your mind by anything else that does not have Jesus. But here's the thing. We become vulnerable. We become vulnerable to deception when we are not rooted in Jesus. Like if you ever wonder why like we have some crazy weeks like this, like if you're if maybe some guys, like my emotional spectrum is like here. It's like right here and then like angry, frustrated, and then it stays there, right? Maybe some of y'all, it just looks like this. Like I'm great and then I'm just crying, right? I'm great and then I'm crying. There is no in between. And maybe, I'm not saying you can't be emotional. I'm not saying you can't be an empath. Shout out to empaths out there. Anyways, whatever. I don't Sorry. I'm, I'm, it's, it's a rabbit hole. I'm not going to go into that. 
I'm not saying there's anything wrong with our emotions, but the thing is when we follow Jesus, there's a stability to it. There's a stability to following Jesus. Does not matter what your personality type is. It doesn't matter what type of family you come from. It doesn't matter what type of social economic background you come from. It doesn't matter if you're failing school at a private school or you're failing school at a not private school. I don't what a public school, right? It doesn't matter because there's a, there's a stability that comes when you follow Christ. And here's the thing: the only way you can call out deception is to know what's true. You do not know what you are being deceived by if you don't know what's true. I was watching a, a Netflix series around cults. <laughs> I watched some, I watched some like interesting stuff. Like for me, whenever I watch things, this is the filter I looked through. I was like, would Jackie want to watch this with me? If the answer is no, I just click play, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, because I know if she wants to watch it with me, I'll get in trouble later, right? And so husbands know. So I'm watching this um, documentary on cults and it's quite captivating. It's actually quite interesting to see how these manipulative, manipulative leaders convince others of their principles. And I'm going to tell you some of their principles. It's kind of wild. But I'm also dumbfounded as to what people are willing to do once their philosophies are solidified. Once they have determined what they believe, you would be amazed what people are willing to do. There's this one cult leader, right? Like they go through like different cults, right? I was just like, this is amazing, right? This is crazy. People are wild, right? There's some crazy people out there, right? But in this one cult, this cult leader convinced everyone in the group, and this is not like five people. This is like 50 people, that we are all not human. We are not human. We're actually aliens. And, and the mothership is going to come and is going to rescue us. And so we're just waiting for ascension, we're eternal beings and we're waiting for ascension. One of the co-founder cult leaders died and they're like, wait a second, I thought we were eternal. And they're just like, don't worry, they're coming, they're coming, right? And they, that's what they convinced them of. They convinced the entire cult that they were aliens stuck in human bodies. Wild philosophies, right? I'm telling you. Another cult group convinced the entire group that he was a messianic figure. This was during the, um, the 60s, the hippie days, and so like, they were probably not sober-minded, but he convinced everyone that I am a messianic figure, that I've come to save the world. And what he did was he convinced everyone that he was the Messiah. And so he started weaponizing his cult. And he, yeah, weaponizing and started putting them on assassination politi assassinating political leaders. Normal people. Normal people under crazy philosophies doing crazy things because they've determined in their spirit that this is true. And throughout the documentary, they interview these ex-cult members. And I'm always laughing at these ex-cult members. I'm just like, you're so dumb, right? But I'm just laughing at them. But the thing is this. They all say the same story. And it started with filling a gap that they were searching for. And I'm wondering how much of us in our lives where there's a small gap that Jesus needs to fill, but we fill it with something else. They all say that it did not start with mass deception. It didn't start with all of this crazy stuff that would happen. It just started with them meeting a small need in my life that seemed right. A small need in my right that sounded right. Everyone else around me was getting blessed, so why not move towards it? But as they got deeper and deeper, the deception began to take root until their philosophy and their or wisdom was so broken, they didn't know what was true. And at the end of the documentary, the narrator, the one that's talking about this stuff, um, he said this statement, the one that are most susceptible to joining a cult are those that are open-minded. The ones that do not have a strong opinion or belief. And does this not sound like our generation? Does this not sound like I'm just open-minded? I just go with the flow. I don't have a plan. I don't use my calendar. I'm just going with the flow, right? That's just our generation. I'm just open to things. I do not want to confront people because I don't want to hurt your feelings. And some of us Christians feel that tension as well, where you're in your lunch circles and they're saying some rancid stuff and you're not standing up for the things of God because you do not want to confront the things that are not true. But here's the thing, Vox Jen. Jesus was a confronter. Jesus was a challenger, and he was not just a challenger of thought. He challenged tradition. He challenged lifestyle. He challenged 
everything. And as a follower of Christ, we are called to challenge people towards the truth. And that's love. It says the truth shall set you free. The truth sets people free. Everything else enslaves them. TikTok enslaves you. You think you're watching TikTok and you think you're watching your college, the college people preaching? Bro, like some of that stuff is wild. Because the thing is this. The thing about deception is that I'm not too worried about the Doja Cats. I'm not too worried about the Drakes. I'm not too worried about that one Disney star that went crazy. I, I don't even, she like came out with a song. I'm not even going to say it because it's wild. But um, yeah, all the youth are like, yeah, she's crazy, right? You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not worried about them because it's blatant demonic activity. And we can call it out. What's scary is that the small deception within the church. And the small things where you're just like, oh, that, that kind of sounds right. I'm not too sure. And we're going to dive into that. Don't you worry. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. And so we see Paul directing the church to remember that Christ is the center of the fullness of wisdom. It's not Socrates. It's not Plato. It's not Aristotle. It's not these Greek philosophers that have empty worldly wisdom. Smart sounds right empty. It's not Andrew Tate or whoever else is popular. I don't even know if he's popular anymore. By your responses, I'm guessing it's not exactly who? Who's that, right? It's not according to human wisdom, but according to Christ, because he is a treasure of wisdom and knowledge. Amen? So now we read on. It says this in verse 8, so see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world. Now, when I first read this, I'm going to be honest. I, I've read this passage multiple times. When I read elemental spirits, I was like, God, I did not know that there were elemental demons in this world. God, I did not know that there was a fire demon, a water demon, a poof demon, right? I didn't know there's an earth demon. God, this is crazy. My goodness, I knew that there was a spiritual warfare happening, but I didn't know that they were breathing fire. God, this is crazy. Give me eyes to see. Incorrect. That's not what elemental spirits mean. It's inaccurate. But this is an unusual word, if we can admit. It's slightly unusual. But elemental spirits in the Greek is stoicheia. And stoicheia more accurately translates as elements of anything. For example, I'm going I'm to I'm 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 explain it for you guys, okay? The ABCs are the stoicheia or elements of the alphabet. Does that make sense? ABCs are the stoicheia or the elements of the alphabet. All right, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper. Red fingertips, large hoop earrings, and long stick on nails are the stokea or elements of a hot Cheeto girl. Amen? Yeah. If you got like, if, if your fingertips are red from last night and you got the hoop earrings, you're a hot Cheeto girl. It's the stokeas of a hot Cheeto girl. You know it's true. You know it's true. All right, we're going to dig a little deeper. If you have LED strips in your room, if you spend too much time on your Pinterest aesthetic, and you're proud of saying, I thrifted it, right? <laughs> if that's you, you are, this is the stokea or the elements of Gen Z. <laughs> and if you say the phrase, I'm still young at heart, I'm still young, this is a stokea or the elements of millennials, right? <laughs> I'm still young. You're not young. Your back hurts. <laughs> As well, man. So what are the basic principles or the basic elements of the world? In Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 23, it says this, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or without regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Everything belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on Ascent oh my goodness, ascentism, ascentism, my goodness, I butchered that word. And the word worship of angels, uh, going on in details about visions puffed up without reason by central mind and not holding fast to the head to whom the whole body nourished, knit together through its joints, ligaments, going, grow with a growth that is from God. And if you, if Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, 
Why, as if you are alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? When it's talking about this regulations, it's talking about the elemental spirits. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to all things that perish as they are used, according to the human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in prompting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What this is just saying is that the world gives us worldly knowledge, worldly philosophies that say, don't do this, don't do that, don't follow that rule, don't break this, but it does not set us free. It will not set you free. The only thing that sets us free is Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on that cross that gives us grace today. Worldly philosophers are laws. Don't do this. Don't do that. It's as Pastor Adam was saying just this past two weeks ago. He said, Mount Sinai, when the law was given, it's the law. It's regulations that we need to follow or else there will be consequence. But when Jesus died on that cross, he not only fulfilled the law, but he put us under a new covenant of grace. Which doesn't mean we don't follow the law. Just because we're under grace doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want. But when Jesus fulfilled all that was written in the law and what the prophets had written about, he wanted to show us that everything since the Old Testament has been pointing back to him. That it's all about Jesus. So now under grace, we follow the law not because of consequence, not because of regulation, but because of our devotion to Christ. It's a different heart posture. It's completely different if my relationship with my wife, I did things because if I didn't do it, she could hit me when I get home. Completely different relational dynamic. But I do the things that I want to do because it's out of devotion. My heart is sold out. And I wonder if our heart is sold out to God today. Or I wonder if it's been deceived by the world. I wonder if we've been playing in different camps and thinking that we could have the best of both worlds when we know that we've been bought at a price. And here's the thing. If you are a follower of Jesus and you believe that you were bought at a price, what that means is that your life is no longer your own. Your preferences, your opinions are not your own. Your dreams are not your own. I'm sorry to say it. Those seniors, it's like, man, God, I want to go to this college. Go to your college. Go have fun, right? But what I'm saying is that we position our lives in a way where it's like, Jesus, I just want to do what you want to do. Jesus, I just want to do what makes you happy. Jesus, I want to desire the things that you desire. That's why in worship, we tell you to raise your hand. Why? Because in the word it says that Jesus loves the raising of hands. I don't know why, but he does. Because there's a time in the Bible where David was not able to go to the temple because there was people coming up against it. So he said, God, you know my heart. I want to go to the temple. Would you instead see the raising of my hands as burnt incense? And God received that as offering. And so that's why we raise our hands. That's why we shout on to God. That's why we sing with our voices because we're confessional Christians. We don't just live the life, but we confess it out of our mouths. So how do we apply this to our lives? How do we do this thing? It sounds like a lot. And um, I saw this movie called 1917 a few years ago. Don't worry, guys. I'm not just like watching movies all week, okay? <laughs> um, it's this movie called 1917. And it follows this young soldier that's delivering a message where they're about to attack the German army. But it's an ambush. And they've been waiting for this day, and he needs to get this message onto the battlefield. And so he finds out where they are, and they're like, where's, where's uh, General McKenzie? He's looking for General McKenzie, and he finds out from one of the soldiers, he's out in the front lines. He's out in the front lines, and they are about to attack in about two minutes. I don't know how long it was. And so he runs. He's running, and as he's running, the first wave is already going in. The first wave is already going in. The battle is beginning. There is bombs that are having. There's an enemy to be had, and there's a soldier. As he is passing, he says to the soldiers around him, hold fast. 
that there's bombs going around. It's just like hold fast to the things that are true. And so what their soldiers were doing, they were holding fast in the trenches against the wall to protect themselves. And I feel like this is a word that us as believers of God, we need to hold fast to the things that are true. We need to know that there's a real enemy out there that wants to destroy our lives. And the only way that we're going to come against, the only way that we are not going to be deceived is if we hold fast to the things of God. We don't need to worry about the enemy. We don't need to worry about their plans. We don't need to worry about all of that stuff. The only thing we need to do is to hold fast on the things of Jesus. And when we do those things, we cannot be deceived. When we do those things, He gives us freedom. When we do those things, He gives us vision for our lives. When we do those things, our desires change for the things of God. When we do those things, we experience breakthrough and freedom in our lives. So if you're feeling stuck today, you don't have to stay that way. You don't have to stay stuck that way. Jesus is the hidden treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And he wants to be found. He loves being found. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.